Hello my dear tech enthusiasts, in this video, based on today's ADATA M.2 SSD, I'll talk about what I personally look out for when buying a new SSD. Of course I don't want to go too deep into detail, so I'll name the most important points and no-goes. Albeit it needs to be said that each and every one of us has slightly different use cases, thus criteria for SSDs. So today's testing slash review candidate is the new so-called ADATA XPG SX8100 M.2 NVMe SSD with a capacity of 1TB. At the time of this video, the 1TB version would set you back about 145 US dollars, which pretty much is a fairly usual price for an SSD of this caliber. Very well, now let's take a look what awaits us when picking up this one by ADATA and, generally speaking, what to look out for when making an SSD purchase. There comes very little included, literally. The SSD in its tiny form factor, along with a small but nice heatsink for the SSD. Certainly a nice little touch, just in case our motherboards don't come with any M.2 heatsinks. In short words, what awaits us with the ADATA SX8100? As said before, it's an M.2 SSD in the 2280 form factor slash length, pretty ordinary. The interface is the M key, so it doesn't fit into slots that primarily are intended for B key drives. But actually, M key has pretty much already taken over the last couple of years. The interface is PCIe 3.0 x4, so four lanes along with the NVMe 1.3 protocol. The SX8100 offers capacities starting at 256GB to all the way up to 4TB. My position today is the golden mean, 1TB. ADATA promises sequential read and write speeds of up to 3500 and 1900 megabytes per second, respectively. As for the controller, they've gone for the 8-channel Realtek RTS 5762, which as we know, does use a DRAM architecture, so DRAM cache. Albeit, the actual capacity is unknown to us, or at least it is to me. 3D TLC NAND comes into play here. The TBW, according to ADATA, for the 1TB model is at 640TB, which admittedly isn't even that much. Nonetheless, it seems the manufacturer has a lot of faith in their product, since they are backing it up with a 5-year warranty. Very well, the NAND flash memory itself, unsurprisingly, apparently comes from in-house by ADATA themselves. Ok, by now I'd be ready to show you all my test results, but before that, we'll take on the topic I've talked about in the beginning of the video. What to look out for when buying an SSD. First of all, you should ask yourself the question on how much money you want to or can spend. As with everything in life, there's the saying, buy cheap, buy twice. This however does not mean all low price offers are bad deals. At the end of the day, it all comes down to each individual's use case. Besides costs, the next important point sure is the drive capacity, how many gigabytes or terabytes you want or even need. After that, we mostly decide on the form factor. The most common one being the 2.5 inch drive. Such can only be had with the SATA interface, though, for the most part, 6 gigabits per second, so roughly 500 to 550 megabytes per second in speed. The modern form factor, without any power or data cables required, goes by the name of M.2. Such SSDs you can grab in a few different interfaces. It could be SATA 6 gigabit per second as well, but also PCI Express. And this is where we additionally have to differentiate between PCIe 3.0 and 4.0, as well as X2 and X4 lanes. Alternatively, there are also our SSDs out there as add-in cards, which you install into your PCIe slot just like you do with graphics cards. But those are not as common. Mainly in the enterprise slash server area, there is also another interface to be found, so-called UDA2 SSDs. I will not be talking about those today, however, since for us ordinary end consumers, those are pretty much irrelevant. Alright, moving on to the next point, the interface, or rather its linked speed. Traditional 2.5 inch SSDs these days mainly go for SATA 6 gigabit per second, which practically is specified for roughly up to 600 megabytes per second. The M.2 form factor on the other hand also does happen to offer us SATA 6 gigabit per second SSDs. 
things get interesting and really fast once PCI Express along with NVMe protocols come into play. In most cases, we are looking at either PCIe 3.0 with two or four lanes or PCIe 4.0 with two or four lanes. PCIe 4.0, as we know, offers double the bandwidth, but not each and every platform out there supports that standard. So you need to keep an eye out for compatibility. When it comes to AMD, there's support for PCIe 4.0 since the AMD Ryzen 3000 series CPUs, officially with B550 and X570 chipsets. Intel is a bit late to that party and will only start officially supporting that standard with their upcoming 11th gen CPUs, along with their Z590 chipset for instance, hopefully Z490 as well. In theory, one should also pay attention to the controller taking care of the SSD, but that's where things can get a little complicated. In the end, it comes down to specific variants. I would advise reading or watching reviews of specific SSDs to get a better idea on that. One of the by far most important aspects when it comes to choosing an SSD, undoubtedly, is the type of NAND flash memory used. This is where we need to differentiate between SLC, MLC, TLC and QLC. Initially, there was only SLC memory. SLC stores one bit per cell, meaning it's extremely fast and durable, has a long lifespan. High capacities would, however, cost half a fortune, which is why SLC memory in that shape and form pretty much is non-existent for us end consumers by now. It still comes into play in enterprise solutions, though. MLC, on the other hand, already contains two bits per cell, thus can store significantly more data per cell at a lower price. But it's slower than SLC and comes with a shorter lifespan. To the aid, however, often comes SLC cache. To this day, the by far most popular NAND memory still remains TLC. That one contains three bits per cell, but is once again slower than MLC and not as durable. To help, manufacturers also often implement SLC caching, exactly the case as with today's ADATA SX8100. The big advantage, not only high speeds, but capacities too, at fairly decent prices. But the industry has gone one step further, and this is how QLC came to be. You guessed it, 4 bits per cell stored on that one. Meaning, the density is pretty high, which in turn means even higher capacities for even less money. The technical price to pay, however, the speeds drop by a lot, and we are no longer talking of a long life expectancy anymore, depending on the model and how often and how much data you write to those cells. Many manufacturers do, however, go for something called over-provisioning to battle those relatively short lifespans, and that helps a lot, as long as the PC user doesn't go overboard with wearing out the SSD. Furthermore, many, but certainly not all manufacturers, implement some sort of SLC cache, which can do wonders. This means the best compromise at the end of the day seems to be TLC. For some reference, one can take a look at those stated TBW values by the manufacturers to help make a choice. TBW pretty much is an estimate on how many write cycles the SSD can withstand, mostly in terabytes or best case scenario, petabytes. Long-term tests have proven, however, that NAND flash memory often can withstand a lot more than manufacturers officially state. They are mostly being overcautious. I would, however, not touch SSDs that do not come with any DRAM cache or buffer. Unfortunately, not all manufacturers tend to clearly label which of their models do come with a DRAM cache and which don't. This sadly is a very common trap for consumers that don't do enough research before buying. And I was a victim myself too, once when I quickly picked out a random SSD by a well-known brand in a matter of minutes without even checking out reviews. A DRAM cache is of great importance though, it helps actively keeping track of where the data is physically stored on the cells fast and efficiently. Furthermore, this also leads to a noteworthy increase of the SSD's lifespan, especially when having an operating system such as Windows installed on there. Data access is much faster with DRAM caching. These are often random read and write scenarios. Without any DRAM cache, things can get really ugly. 
I'm speaking from experience. Long story short, my preference is TLC NAND memory along with SLC and DRAM caching, preferably with a nice high TBW number. The higher the capacity, the higher that TBW number most of the time, obviously. Alright, and now finally the test results of today's ADATA SX8100 SSD. Enjoy! As was to be expected, the ADATA SX8100 offers very high speeds and in a couple of tests partially manages to outperform a PCIe 3.0 x4 SSD by the competition. Unfortunately, my charts are pretty lame for now when it comes to NVMe SSDs, so there's hardly any real comparison going on there. But what clearly can be seen is that there are some major performance differences to be witnessed between M.2 PCIe 3.0 x4 and x2 as well as ordinary SATA SSDs. For specific use cases, more can be significantly better, but not in each and every instance out there such as programs and games. This does not automatically translate into quicker loading times for instance. Depending on the case, there still needs to be done a lot of optimizing by software and game developers, which speaking from experience can take years. Nonetheless, at least the hardware is there. The bottom line is, I can definitely recommend picking up this ADATA XPG SX8100 M.2 NVMe SSD and its 1TB variant. At a price of roughly $145, it by no means can be considered a bargain, but it's also far from being a bad deal. With that said, I hope you enjoyed this slightly different approach on covering that SSD. Hopefully I didn't bore you too much. After all, SSDs aren't necessarily among the hottest topics out there anymore. Thank you so much for watching.